Hello, my name is Michael Coots. I am a staff engineer at Southwest Research Institute. And today I will be talking about recent research uh, related to real-time image processing for the rapid identification of novel astrophysical phenomena. This work was conducted in support of the CYBEX mission concept. Uh, CYBEX stands for Shock Interaction and Breakout Explorer. Uh, and this mission was recently proposed to NASA. The goal of the mission is to observe supernovae and other energetic astrophysical phenomena in the first few minutes and hours after they are visible. Important scientific information can be gathered about these events in that time frame um, that isn't available as the, uh, the event continues to, to develop over time. Uh, the Cybex uh, spacecraft is shown on the right. Uh, includes two key instruments. Uh, the first is the X-ray finder, which we refer to as XRF. This is a wide field of view instrument sensitive to X-rays. Uh, it's built from multiple independent sensors and that is visible in the, in the model to the right. Uh, if you look at the arrow, the uh, pointing to the XRF module, you see numerous independent um, units in each of these as an independent sensor. Uh, this is a photon counting instrument. So it's sensitive to individual X-ray photons uh, arriving at the spacecraft and it will uh, report the, the occurrence of these as well as localize them relative to the sensor. The other major instrument on board the Cybex spacecraft is the Cybex Ultraviolet Spectrograph and Imager, or CC. Uh, this is a much narrower field of view instrument. Uh, it includes an ultraviolet imager, as well as a very narrow field of view ultraviolet spectrometer. And the field of view of the spectrometer is roughly centered within the field of view of the, of the ultraviolet imager. Now, in order to achieve um, the objectives of the Cybex mission, we need to do several things. Uh, the first is we need to automatically detect novel X-ray sources. So this is the identification of X-ray sources in the sky that are locations that are not associated with a known uh, source of X-ray emissions. We also need the ability to detect unexpectedly brightening X-ray sources. So these are X-ray sources that are at known locations um, but are, are substantially brighter than anticipated. And this is also an indication of a potential event that we should monitor more closely. In addition, we need the ability to detect and localize targets within the ultraviolet imager. Uh, so while we are primarily detecting novel and brightening events uh, in the X-ray field of view, we need the ability to also find these events in the ultraviolet imager uh, and localize them within that field of view. Coupled with all of this is the ability to autonomously select targets and adjust the spacecraft attitude uh, to observe them. So the overall con op is the detection of either a novel or unexpectedly brightening source in X-rays. Uh, at that point, that information is delivered to uh, a, a targeting uh, algorithm that, that determines whether it should uh, select that target for further observation. If so, the spacecraft is redirected, so the ultraviolet imager uh, is directed towards that observed event. In that case, the event must be identified and localized within the ultraviolet imager field of view. And once that has happened, the spacecraft is again uh, redirected so that the event can be monitored with the ultraviolet spectrograph. So this is achieved by continuously monitoring the wide field of view XRF instrument for these new events, uh, detecting the multiple event types, um, either brightening or novel sources, then once we've directed the UV imager uh, towards the new event, we need to estimate attitude control errors and other distortions uh, in the UV image, correct those for those distortions and, and attitude control errors, um, and then accurately reckon, locate the targets in the UV data. All of this must be accomplished in real time on very resource constrained computational hardware. The processing platform we have available is the Central Instrument Data Processor or, SI, or CIDP. Uh, this includes a microsemi RTG4 FPGA that does a lot of the high speed signal processing, uh, as well as a Leon 3 processor. So we'll begin by talking about the XRF data processing. So this is the data from the uh, X-ray instruments. To, to solve this problem, we first utilize a very a large abstract coordinate system. Each of the individual X-ray sensors has a, a smaller field of view. Um, the, nominally, these smaller fields of view tile a space uh, in the sky, but that, that tiling won't be perfect. 
Uh, there'll be some overlap, there'll be some small gaps. And so we handle that by embedding the individual XRF sensitor fields of view in this larger abstract coordinate system. And this, this is um, defined notionally to the right. Uh, the, the degree of mismatch of overlap and gaps will not be this severe, uh, but I, this provides a, a notional um, sense of, of how the individual XRF sensors are embedded in this larger space. The space, the larger abstract space is designed so that it can handle any, any variation in the individual sensor fields of view. We also then decompose this abstract coordinate system into a set of tiles, and those are shown in blue uh, here in this image, a small subset of them. These image tiles um, just break up the space in, into smaller regions. They perfectly tile it, uh, and are actually quite a bit smaller than shown here. Uh, these are a little bit larger to illustrate the concept. So our image processing approach for the X-ray data is to process uh, data in sensor batches. So each of the individual sensors will deliver us a list of observed photons along with their locations uh, periodically every few seconds. We take those photon arrival events and map them into this larger abstract coordinate space. We then attempt to associate those observed photons with known sources. An important consideration here is that about 10% of our localized photons will actually have spurious locations. Uh, this is a consequence of the readout processing from the, the X-ray instrument. And so we need to deal with the fact that we will be getting large quantities of data uh, that is inaccurately located. As we process these photon events, we accumulate information for novel events. So photons arriving uh, at a particular location that isn't associated with a known source, uh, we accumulate information about um, photons that arrive from that region of the sky as it represents a potential new novel source. Uh, we also monitor uh, the brightness of these known, of known sources for significant departures from, from the expectations for how bright they should be. This processing does make use of a catalog of known X-ray sources. Uh, we're planning around uh, a catalog consisting of up to 2,000 known sources uh, within a single XRF field of view at a given time. Uh, each known source is associated with a, a, an image tile and simply identifying which image tile uh, in, in the overall abstract coordinate system uh, the photon is associated with. And when we seek to associate a arriving photon with a known source, um, we first identify the tile uh, where the, the photon arrives, and then we search a, a list of known sources within that tile uh, to see if, if the observed photon is close enough to a known source. Uh, this this um, searching process supports high throughput uh, because the catalog of sources within a given tile is relatively small. Uh, it is important to note that the point spread function of our known source, this is relatively large, it generally spans multiple tiles. Uh, in this case, the source is listed as a potential uh, source of photons in each tile uh, that it overlaps. Now, in the case of novel source detection, um, where we are monitoring incoming photons, looking for uh, new sources, novel sources, we maintain what we call a portfolio for each potential novel source. This is basically information on arriving photons that may represent a novel source. Uh, as we accumulate this information, uh, we monitor it and, and compare and, and check against thresholds for a minimum number of photons, as well as a minimum arrival rate. Uh, if we see both of those, both a minimum number of photons and, a, and an expected or an high enough arrival rate, uh, we may declare that, that we have observed uh, a novel source. But portfolios also have the ability to time out. So if we do not see new data associated with a particular location frequently enough, uh, we will simply close out that portfolio, discard the data. And this is a mechanism to deal with the spurious um, photons I mentioned earlier. Uh, while a portfolio is open, we're recording the complete information associated with it. So every um, bit of information we have about the photons uh, that, that are present in that portfolio, we retain so that if it is a novel event, uh, we can provide complete and detailed information uh, to software to, to help it decide if, if this is a, an event worth observing. We also perform brightness monitoring. So for those photons that can be matched to a known source, uh, we track the observed brightness of the source, um, compare it to what we expect, and uh, report a detection when the photon arrival rate significantly exceeds the expectations. 
because the anticipated brightness of the various sources in the sky can, can be different, of course. Uh, we have unique detection parameters for each source. And the overall computation flow is shown to the right here. Uh, in, incoming photon events are first checked against a very simple quality test uh, for validity of data. Uh, we then compare them to a uh, range of amplitudes. The amplitude information for an individual photon here represents the energy of the photon, not the brightness. Um, and different observation campaigns may, may have different uh, energy bands they're interested in, and we can filter out um, photons that don't meet this criteria. If a photon passes both those criteria, uh, we do the coordinate transformation to the global coordinate system. And then we execute the tile search of searching uh, the tile associated with the photon event for, for potential known sources. And this makes use of the catalog of, of known X-ray sources in the field of view. If we can associate the photon event with a known source, uh, then we will monitor that source for deviations from, from what we expect in brightness. This makes use of an additional catalog uh, that records parameters for the expected brightness for the known sources. If it appears to be a novel source, we either open a portfolio or add it to an existing portfolio uh, and, they, and, and monitor it for uh, adequate photon arrivals to detect the event. Um, in those cases, we are maintaining uh, data on the, the photons that make up the, uh, the portfolio. We implemented a prototype of this algorithm and, and evaluated it in MATLAB. Uh, we're simulating the data sources, so the X-ray field of view. This is done with only moderate fidelity. It's not based on an actual sky map or actual uh, realistic brightness values, um, but we do have all the variations and, and, the, and the parameters that are present. Uh, we also simulate the detection algorithm um, as, as photons come in from the simulated data source and evaluate this with, with Monte Carlo trials to get a sense of the statistical performance. Uh, these simulations use 500 known sources, um, Sensor data arrived in batches at eight or 24 second intervals. So within a simulation, some sensors deliver at eight second intervals, some at 24 second intervals. And this is in line with the mission plan. Uh, we also observe for 300 seconds, also in line with the mission plan. Uh, the data on the right represents 100 trials of simulation. So at the top, we see the behavior for what we call the nominal scenario, where there's neither an unexpectedly brightening source nor any novel sources, merely a sky full of expected sources. In our simulations, we had 0% uh, chance of falsely detecting a novel source. We did have one instance of falsely detecting a brightening source, probably due to uh, two randomly generated background stars landing on top of each other and exceeding the expectation uh, for brightness. We do track the maximum number of open portfolios. As I said, we have a large number of spurious photons. Each of these produces uh, the opening of a portfolio. It's usually quickly closed uh, due to the timeout process because we don't expect the spurious photons to repeat. But nonetheless, we do need a large number of portfolios that we can open to handle this case. Um, so we observed uh, in this simulation about 1400 portfolios open. Uh, similarly, we want matched or monitored the number of spurious events that we are receiving. Our models do capture the spurious uh, event generation process. Uh, so for a single instrument, we observed uh, up to 80 spurious photons in a data delivery batch. Uh, also, we monitored the, the frequency of spurious events, uh, maximum and mean, that's about seven or eight percent of our, of our data in the simulation. We also simulated the case of detecting a novel source, um, where we have a single novel source in a background. Um, here we had a 94% uh, success rate in detecting that source, 2% um, false alarm rate where we misattributed it to a brightening source, probably because the novel source overlapped with a known source. And then very similar data about the number of open portfolios, um, the unmatched events rates, uh, and the spurious events. In this case, the unmatched event rates is a little bit higher because some of those events are in fact due to the novel source. Now a little bit about the implementation of the XRF processing algorithm. Uh, our, our implementation is driven by throughput needs. We may have up to 50,000 photons per second uh, arriving in the system. Uh, much of the processing was done in the RTG4 FPGA. It receives the data from the XRF instrument 
uh, performs initial data con data filtering, coordinate conversion, executes the tile search, um, maintains the portfolios as well as the brightness monitoring. We also make use of a significant amount of SDRAM. Uh, this is dedicated for this image processing function. It's directly connected to the FPGA. Uh, this stores the known source catalog, which is organized by tiles, uh, maintains the brightness monitoring parameters, and also is where we store the event information um, for the portfolios. The table to the right shows some key um, parameters from uh, the analysis of our implementation. Um, we do use a little bit of the FPGA's block RAM, about 7% of that. Um, we looked at throughput, um, both for photons associated with a known source and photons associated with a novel source. Uh, processing for known source photons requires about 373 clock cycles and supports uh, over 268,000 photons per second. Um, and this will represent the vast majority of photons we observe, even in cases where a novel source is present. Um, if the photon can't be matched to a known source, either because it's from a novel source or because it's spurious, uh, we require substantially longer uh, to process that data because uh, we need to deal with the portfolios, um, including possibly searching a large number of portfolios for a match. Uh, in this case, uh, our processing rate would be limited to just under 3000 photons per second. Our actual overall throughput will be a mixture of these two rates um, based on the proportion of um, photon events from, from each of the sources. And so we should be able to hit our, our uh, throughput objective um, with, with the anticipated mixture. Uh, we also use a fair amount of the SDRAM, but in only just a little over 7% to hold the catalogs. Now, the second element of processing deals with the CC images. Um, the objective here is to uh, observe uh, ultraviolet sources in the image, associate them with a catalog of known sources, correct for errors um, in the imagery, uh, and be able to report accurate locations. So this processing accepts a single CC UV image, as well as a catalog of known sources, and outputs the precise location um, for all the sources in the image, you know, anticipated or not, as well as flags indicating which sources were unexpected. Uh, the basic approach is to select four sources in the image. Now, we select four uh, because we need three uh, to perform the matching we'll be doing uh, and, and add one more in case it is a novel source that we weren't anticipating. So we match, we find the best match of a subset of the four image stars to three catalog sources. Once we've done that matching, once we've linked observed stars with anticipated stars in the catalog, uh, we can correct for errors uh, between image and catalog coordinates and then compute the locations of all sources observed in the image uh, and identify those sources in the image that were not in our catalog. Now the matching algorithm uh, needs to deal with image distortions, including translations and rotation that are due to imperfect attitude control, as well as scale compression. Um, in the in, in the images, and that scale compression may not be uniform in X and Y. And in fact, that's the most challenging distortion to deal with. We do this by matching triangles. We form a triangle of observed uh, UV sources and try and match that against a triangle of known catalog sources. Um, each triangle has a metric. Uh, we use two different metrics. One is the interior angles and one is the inner product. Um, interior angles is very robust to all of our distortions except mismatch in the scaling compression. Uh, inner product is less robust to those distortions, um, but is uh, less computationally complex to compute. Uh, we have three different matching algorithms. One is a simple best match, trying to um, best match triangle metrics between imagery and catalog sources. We have an extension to that, which selects a handful of the best matches uh, based on that first uh, process and the triangle metrics, and then attempts to do a confirmation. It applies the estimated transformation to a catalog source and determines if there is an image source uh, at the expected location. And then finally, we have an extension of that, which does a similar process of predicting the location from a catalog source, uh, an image source, but then measuring the distance to each image source so and, and selecting uh, the best match based on, on a minimum distance in that prediction. Now in the known source catalog for this instrument, 
uh, includes two things, a list of triangles with pre-computed metrics. We don't wanna be computing those on the fly. And then also a list of sources with absolute locations. The ultimate transformation uh, shows up as an affine transformation, which is represented by the, the matrix equation there. Now we did a fair amount of evaluation of this algorithm, again, in simulation, uh, using random star fields um, and attempting to determine how likely we are to find proper matches. So this table lists the three different methods, um, simple matching, matching with confirmation, and ma matching with minimization. Uh, the second row indicates the number of points that were used in the methods. I said handful earlier. Uh, sometimes we use five good matches, sometimes 10. Uh, we also see some variation in the triangle metric used. Um, interior angles, which tend to perform better, and inner products, which tend to have low computational complexity. Uh, the main thing we're tracking here is the scaling compression discrepancy. Uh, that's the most challenging distortion. And what these simulations show is we actually have a good trade space um, that lets us balance computational complexity with match performance uh, against the, uh, the maximum extent of the scaling discrepancy. So once the instrument is further refined and we have a better understanding of the scaling discrepancy, uh, we can then make a trade between computational complexity and therefore throughput versus accuracy. Um, clearly we have quite a, quite a good range of uh, capabilities here. So this last slide shows the uh, implementation uh, overall for the Cybex mission. Um, on the SIDEP hardware, we have the RTG4 FPGA, which accepts the XRF data, performs novel source detection, as well as brightness monitoring. This FPGA also accepts the SUSI image data. It identifies image sources in that data um, as a first stage of SUSI processing. The Leon 3 processor is responsible for computing, configuring the XRF catalogs used uh, in the processing, as well as the SUSI catalogs used in the processing. And it does the vast majority of the image processing for the, the CC process. The setup includes a large quantity of volatile SDRAM, which holds working catalogs um, for the XRF processing, as well as event lists for that processing. And it also includes non-volatile flash memory, which contains the full sky catalog from which we build the individual catalogs for the fields of view. Now, some other topics that are relevant that we're working on is the target selection process. I haven't talked about that, that's a lot of scope for this talk, um, but its job is to select an observation target um, from both a pre-computed observation schedule, uh, onboard detections, as well as detections from other systems uh, that might be forwarded to the observatory. Uh, this system also does science processing within the CIDP hardware. Uh, this is, includes formatting and compressing all of the XRF and CC data for, for later analysis um, storing that to non-volatile memory and trans transmitting it to ground stations uh, when there's a contact. Continuing work in this uh, includes evaluating algorithms with higher fidelity instrument data. We're currently working on gathering uh, more accurate data uh, that we might run through these algorithms uh, to evaluate its performance. Based on that, there will certainly be additional uh, refinements and improvements we can make to the algorithms to, to uh, improve the performance there and then development of, of the target selection algorithm itself uh, that uses these results. So I want to thank you for my time. Um, if, you have any if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at this information here.